Okay, so agenda for today, I want to go over a couple questions from the midterm and uh, the rest of it, I will produce a short video uh, going over the results. I don't have time to go over the complete exam in class because we also need to get to uh, doing how you do custom painting in graphical user interfaces so that you can make some more progress on the homework assignment. But those are the two big things uh, to talk about today. So let's just dive in with the uh, midterm. So right now, the median for the midterm is roughly a 67. And I would prefer that the median be somewhere closer to about 77. So you can see that's a 10 point gap. So I am going to wait first for regrade requests, but once the regrade requests are done, essentially what I'm going to do is compute the new median, which will probably not move very much, might move by a point. But then I'm going to take whatever the median is at that point and subtract it from 77. So let's say it's gone up to 69 at that point. The difference would be eight points and everyone will get an extra eight points added to their exam. So um, regrade requests, what I would like you to do is email me those. We can also discuss them in office hours today. But otherwise, um, email your regrade request to me and I'll take a look at them. And as I said, once I'm done with that, I'll recompute the new median and increase everyone's uh, grade by the difference between uh, 77 and whatever that median is. So if you got, you know, I understand the uh, scores were lower than I would have liked and I'm sure then that you would have liked, um, but don't despair. First of all, um, the exams always bring your uh, grade down a little bit. The homework assignments and the pre-class activities bring it up. Uh, I, for me, average means average. Uh, I, I know everyone wants to get in the 80s or 90s, but to me, average is around a 77. So that's what I'm shooting for with an exam. It's, the, the exams are meant to help me assess what you understand and what you don't understand. And unfortunately, sometimes that means you're not doing so hot because certain topics are difficult uh, to grasp. And what I got again out of this exam as I've gotten out of my exams in the past is that inheritance is still a really hard um, topic for many of you to get your heads around. Uh, in general, most of you did well with uh, the first uh, six problems. I question five, so I'm going to go back now and go to the solutions. So question five, I did think people would do a bit better on it than uh, what happened. So we are going to go over that as well. So question five was having you execute a Java program using a package and then jar it up. And I was putting uh, making you deal with two uh, directories that contained your packages. So I was forcing you to use a class path variable to tell Java where to find the packages. And when you use the class path variable, you only give the directory through the parent of the package and you don't include the directory containing the package in the path name. So here, gov slash tn 
contains the vaccine directory, but you don't include vaccine in the class path. And the same thing with the GUI directory is contained in COMBBZ, but in the class path, you don't include that. You only include the parent directories and then Java looks in those directories uh, for, the pack, for the directories containing the packages that you're using. And then the second thing I was looking for is that you remembered that you needed to fully qualify the name of the class containing main with the package. Now, you don't, some of you put the complete directory path there. Instead of saying vaccine.appointment, you said slash gov slash tn uh, slash vaccine.appointment. And that's not correct. The, uh, you just include the package name and the name of the class. So that was what you needed there. Then for jarring things up, you need it some way to tell me the entry point. And again, um, it's vaccine.appointment. And I did not deduct, I didn't penalize you twice. If you missed the entry point up here, I didn't dock you points the second time for missing it here. Um, I found that only three people had actually looked at the dash C flag, despite the fact that my review guide said to look at it. So I ended up making the dash C flag extra credit. So you got full credit if you uh, put instead of this. So the dash C flag, flag says change directory to whatever you see here. So change directory to gov slash tn and then include this directory in the package, then change to this directory and include this directory in the package. So many of you instead wrote jar dash CEF some stuff. And then you said slash gov slash TN slash vaccine and slash com slash BVZ slash GUI. And I gave you full credit, but this wouldn't work in practice because the problem is it would literally have this as the directory and it wouldn't be able to find vaccine because it is looking for a directory called vaccine. It is not looking for a directory named slash gov slash tn slash vaccine. And that's why you need this dash C flag. Some of you just wrote down vaccine and GUI. I deducted one point for that because you can't be in both directories simultaneously. You could be in the parent directory for vaccine but then you couldn't be in the parent directory for GUI. It wasn't going to find it. So the jar command would have failed. So I gave you a minus one if you just listed vaccine and GUI. You were certainly on the right path, but um, you needed to use this dash C flag in order to change directories. Okay, again, if you used it properly, you got a plus two. There was no penalty for not using it. Okay, questions about that quickly. Dr. Vanderzan, and I've got a I've got a question about this. Um, I on the second part of this, I didn't specify F and I just re redirected the output to appointment.jar. And you said I can't do that, but Oracle documentation says you can do that. Yeah, I actually ran it. It didn't work. I tried it. It didn't work at the terminal window. I think that. Okay, we can talk. Okay, this is the kind of thing I'll, I'll handle offline. Okay, um, I, I don't want to get bogged down. Okay, for sure. Time, but I did try it and it failed. <laughs> so that's why you lost points. You would have gotten okay, points. Okay, thank you. Worked. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Just in general, a question. Not if you have a specific thing where you want a regrade or you think something you know, I took off too many points, put that in a regrade request. But if you just have a general question about this, I'm happy to answer it. 
Okay. Uh, most of you got the generics. Uh, there were some points taken off for different things, but generally you did well. I'm going to go over the, um, the one for computing vote totals first. And I, this was not meant to trip you up as badly as it tripped many of you up. So the, basically you can boil this problem down as follows. You need to read, a li read lines of input and chop each line into names. Then basically add the first name to a voters list, which I'm going to put in quotes because it really shouldn't be a list. Add, um, add one to candidates vote tally for remaining names. Then, so this is kind of one, two, three, four, sort can, uh, candidates by vote total and print. Okay, and then there's some exception handling, but this was essentially the idea. So the first thing I wanted to check was, are you using the right data structures? Because in CS102, you were given different data structures for keeping track of people. And by this time, you should be using the right data structures. You shouldn't be using inefficient data structures. So you should have used a hash set to keep track of voters because it takes order one time to keep uh, to find a voter in a hash set. If you used a list, it was minus two because it takes order n time to search a list for a voter. And if you use a sorted map, you got minus one because that's order log n time. So at this point, I expect you to know the running times for finding, um, for find, delete, and update in different data structures. And I expect you to be able to use the fastest data structure. So the same thing was for candidates. Uh, almost no one used a list, but again, it was minus one for using a sorted map because that's order log n. And a hash map is constant time. Um, also, the sorted map, you might think, well, it kept them in sorted order, but it doesn't. It keeps them in sorted order on the name, not on the vote tally. So there's no reason to keep the candidates in sorted order by name. So that was the first thing I was looking for was proper use of um, a proper selection of data structures. Then I was also looking for proper use of scanners, which most of you did a good job of. Some of you forgot to close your line scanners that chop things into names. So you got a point off, kind of a nuisance, but important to remember to do it. Um, and then the rest of it was, There was, well, let's go through it then to show you how each thing should be done. So, as I said, most of you got the scanners right. You had to stuff system in into a scanner and then you just read a line, you get the next line and you stuff the line into the scanner to chop it up. Okay, at this point, you need a try statement to um, encompass 
exception handling because you might have a repeat voter exception and you might have a no such element exception. So the first thing I try to do is get a voter name and a candidate name. If either of those doesn't exist, I'm going to get a no such element exception thrown. So I catch it down here and I print it out that it must have at least one voter and one candidate. And I used a Boolean to indicate if I was at the start of the ballot um, and after I read it, I set the ballot to false. There were other ways to do this. You could repeat um, the code, which some of you did for tallying a vote. Uh, so some of you put it into a function, it was okay. Uh, at any rate, you needed to have a uh, read of the voter name and the candidate and catch that exception if they didn't exist. Then you try to add the voter to the set. And I guess most of you didn't realize that add um, will return false if it fails to add the voter. If the voter name's already there, add will simply return false. And if it um, is not there, it will add the name to the set and return true. So it was fine to say, to ask if it contains the voter and then if it didn't add it, but you can just call add like I did. And then if it didn't exist, I'm sorry, if it already existed, I do a new repeat voter exception and I caught it down here and I printed out the fact that the voter had already voted. Now, I used only one try statement and that's the intent of try statements is you put all of the code that you think could cause an exception in one try statement and all your catches at the end and that completely separates exception handling from normal logic. Some of you were still putting multiple tries in with catches in the middle of the code so that your code was still getting interrupted with exception handling. And I made a note of that, but I didn't dock points. But generally you want only one try statement that encompasses all the normal logic. So you don't do any exception handling until the end of it. So if the um, voter was not a repeat voter, then I indicated that the start of the ballot was false, that I was reading the remaining names, and I did a put. Um, the easiest way to do it probably is there is a get or default. So what that means is the get um, either returns null, in which case you provide a default value to use, which is zero, or it returns the votes associated with that candidate name. And then in either case, I can add one. Now, most of you did it like this and that's fine. Ask if it contains the candidate name. If it does, you put the candidate name and add one to the get. And otherwise you put the candidate into the hash table. Okay. So that was all you had to do to count votes. And then to sort, you have to dump the, uh, enter the map into a list. And the way you do that is you first dump the map into a set, which is what entry set does. And then you dump the set into something like an array list. And then you sort and the sort has to be able to compare two map entries. And what you care about is the integers. So I'm returning e1.get value minus e2get value. And that will sort on the um, integer values of the vote totals. And it does an in uh, place sort. So at this point, vote count has the entries in sorted order. 
So then I iterate through those pairs and print them out. Okay. Um, just so you know, there, this is so common that you want to keep things in a map and then sort on the value that there is a very simple um, instruction that is provided by the entry class in map called comparing by value. And that will in fact give you a comparator that will compare on the value. But I didn't expect you to know about it. I just wanted you to know about it um, because it's a, such a common thing that you want to do with maps being able to sort on the value. Okay, so that's an overview of how the um, map uh, or the counting should be done. Any questions about that one? Okay. Um, that brings us to the one that really got most of you. And I understand it was a long problem. So the, you, on a problem like this, I often think it's good to actually mark it up. And I know you couldn't have easily marked it up on this one which is why I tried to help you out by giving you a checklist of things that you are going to have to uh, do. So the, but I was pretty specific about what each class was going to um, be doing. So it said all nodes, contain a variable name value of type double, okay? So it should be a hint that probably this is going to go in a top level class because all nodes contain that variable. It also said all nodes contain a parent pointer to their parent. A parent node is always an operator node. So I gave you two pieces of information there. All nodes also contain a parent pointer. So again, a pretty good indication that the top level class is going to contain parent. And a parent node is always an operator node. So an indicator that the type should be an operator, not um, a node. Okay, then I start getting specific. Operator nodes contain pointers to children and a Boolean variable named up to date. And I tell you there are three types of operator nodes, which means that there's probably going to be three classes for them, okay? There's probably going to be one for unary, one for binary, and one for nary. And a couple of you said, that you weren't sure in an operator how many children it, you were supposed to declare. And you are absolutely right, but unfortunately you didn't make the conclusion that operator node was not the place where you should be declaring children. It should be delegating that to its three subclasses, unary, binary, and nary, because unary, binary, and nary do know how many children they have respectively. So the children, their declaration should have been done at the level of the unary, binary, and nary nodes. Okay, then I talked about all nodes have an evaluate method. So again, that should ring a bell that evaluate will need to be declared at the top level that evaluates its operands and returns a double. And the only way an evaluate method is going to know how to evaluate its operands if it, is if it specifically knows the operation. So it's going to have to be a concrete class like either operand or plus evaluate um, plus operator that defines the evaluate method because they're the only ones that have an idea of how to do it. Like for a plus operator, 
it's going to add the values of its two children together. Okay, so then scrolling down, the evaluate method for an operand returns the operand's value. So it specifically is telling you that it's able to provide a concrete implementation in the operand. Then I tell you that operands nodes have get and set methods, value methods, which is a pretty big indicator that um, you're going to have to define, declare methods for an operand for set value and get value. Then I tell you when the operand set value method is called, it calls the parents mark cache invalid method. And I've already told you that a parent is an operator node. So this should be an indication that the mark cache invalid method is going to go with operator nodes. I know it's an inference you have to make, but um, I didn't want to give everything away by being super um, straightforward about it. I did want you to make some um, deductions and this was one of them that since it was calling the parents mark cache invalid method. And since parents are already always operator nodes, mark cache invalid is going to go and be defined with an operator. And the code I gave it to you is going to be the same for all operators, whether it's a binary, unary, or nary. So it's going to go at the level of an operator. And then I told you that operator nodes have a get value method that allows their values to be retrieved and checks to see if the cache is up to date. So again, it's telling you that the get value method is different for an operator and an operand, but this is where, again, I wanted you to make a deduction. Both operator nodes and operand nodes have get value methods. Therefore, get value has to be declared at the top level superclass. Okay, and finally, I gave you a couple other pieces of information. Operator nodes do not have a set value method, hence that should not be defined at the top level because only operand nodes have a set value method. And I told you an nary operator has two methods named add parameter and remove parameter. So at this point, I can quickly go through the solution. And there's more here than you need it to put, okay? So I called the top level class an ex, um, expression node. Many of you called it node, that was fine. So the two variables, parent and value, the two methods that are uh, specific or that all nodes must implement. Evaluate declared abstract because it cannot provide a default implementation. I was okay if you declared get value abstract. My solution said that default implementation is to return the value, but I was perfectly fine if you declared it abstract here. Then you needed an operator node that had the variable up to date and the um, function mark cache and ballot. It should have been declared final because the operator should not override it, but I did not deduct points for not declaring it final. Same thing with get value. An operator node can provide a version of get value for all of its operator subclasses, and hence it should also be declared final here. An operand node, um, it's uh, can declare methods for evaluate set value and I miss and it's inheriting get value from the um, expression node. Most of you also had a get value here. I was fine with that. Okay, coming down to the um, individual operator nodes, this is where they declared their children and their constructors should be um, setting up the children pointers and setting the parent pointers. 
for those children. This should actually be child.parent, not child1.parent. Same thing for the binary and the n-ary operators. Uh, for the n-ary operator, it has a children list um, right here, array list of children, and it has add and remove parameters. Okay, and finally the plus node, it's um, delegates, its constructor delegates the creation of the child uh, pointers to the uh, super class, and then using the super call, and then provides a evaluate method. Okay. Um, so that's, that's how I came up with this solution. I know there's a lot there, but I did feel that the, um, you did get the information you needed in the uh, description and you just kind of had to organize it. And I understand that's tough and I understand inheritance is tough. So if you didn't do well in this problem, try not to be discouraged. Inheritance is not an easy thing to wrap uh, your head around, but it is something that is used in industry and with more repetitions, you will get better at it, okay? Um, I also made the constructors extra credit on this problem. Um, only a few people got the constructors right. So I, uh, constructors were another extra credit item. So any questions about uh, inheritance here? Okay. So as I said, uh, feel free to stick around after class to ask questions about the exam. I have office hours, 15 minutes after class where you can ask questions about the exam. And then you can also um, submit a regrade request. Any of those three things is fine to do. Okay. So with that, what I want to do is head off into how you can do custom painting. So originally I had the MVC model for today, but I decided for the homework assignment, it would help you more the next couple of days if you could do some custom painting and event handling. So I decided to do that instead today. And we'll handle the MVC model on Thursday. So you could basically after today, code up a version of your homework. And then on Thursday, after I go over the MVC model, you can do a bit of refactoring of the code to divide it up into what we call the model, the view, and the controller. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually walk through a series of demos with you. And I think that is the best way to show you how you can do some custom painting and event handling uh, for your uh, uh, project or not project for your homework assignment. So I am using, I, I'm going to make this code available to you. I am using a uh, number of demos from actually the, this trail in Oracle uses the same uh, demo. So I'm just walking through the demo that the Oracle folks had already prepared, but I think it's very helpful uh, to see me kind of walk through it and describe what's going on. Um, also, before I forget, you don't have any more pre-class activities for the rest of the semester. Um, although I might, at times ask you to watch a lecture before pre-recorded lecture uh, so that when we get to class, you can perhaps work on the homework, but we're not at that point just yet. Uh, so there's still quizzes after every class, but there's no pre-class activities from the book because essentially today is the last day that um, you can use something from the Zy book from the course. Okay. So 
the very first thing we're going to do is we're just going to create a window without any special things associated with it. And it is in a class called painting. And you can see that I'm in the painting directory. So in order to run it, I'm going to have to put a class path variable and have it look at the parent. And I'm going to have to use painting because that is the package name. And then swing dot paint demo one. And it printed out a line and it just printed out a blank window. Okay, nothing special. And if I click the go away button, it goes away. So let's take a look at the code. It's in package painting. And the first thing to notice is you should use this kind of idiom that the Java um, developers are using. So they don't put the um, code, they don't run the method that creates the GUI immediately. Instead, they have this little verbose thing, swing utilities dot invoke later new runnable public void run, and they call create and show GUI. What this is doing is saying, don't run it immediately. Instead, there is this thread that is um, starts up after main exits. And we want to run it on that thread. So that's what this invoke later is saying is run it later on the swing utilities thread. And, at, and that will occur after main exits. And at that point, we want to call this method create and show GUI. So in fact, main at this point immediately exits and hence we would be creating and showing the GUI. Now, the reason this is done is that when main is running, the graphics context you need for drawing has not yet been set up. It's only set up when the swing thread starts running. So you don't want to be executing paint commands that will try to paint stuff in main because it won't work the, or it may not work properly because the graphics context that you need has not yet been set up properly until the swing thread starts running. That's why you delay creating and showing the GUI until that time. And again, this create and show name is kind of a standard thing that Java developers do. I suggest you do it as well. So in it, you can see I just did a print um, line where I created the GUI um, and that went out to the console. It wasn't really necessary. It just shows you uh, when it was created. Then I create a J frame. So in order to do any kind of custom painting, you need a J-frame. And this is going to be the title of the J-frame. You noticed when I hit the red close button, it closed the window and exited the application. And that's what this set default close operation does. There's a number of constants. You can look them up. In this course, you will use exit on close. There are other ones that iconify the window, but do not exit the application. Then I set the size of the window to be 250, 250. You saw last time that if I don't either set the size of the window or I don't set the preferred size of the content pane, that it won't show up at all because the natural size is zero, zero, or width of zero and a height of zero. And finally, I set the visibility of the frame to true. So this is just the simplest possible framework. This is kind of something you can just copy every time and start with this code. OK, so then we want to get a bit more interesting. So that will be swing paint demo two. And in swing paint demo two, you see that I'm just drawing a string. This is my custom panel. Hopefully you can see it. It's just drawn a string called this is my custom panel. Okay, and I'm 
we are changing a couple things. So you can see that there's two new statements here and I've gotten rid of the set size. So I'm replacing the frame set size with f.add new my panel and f.pack. So you should remember the pack command from the layout manager lecture. It is invoking the layout manager on the content pane of the frame. And it is um, laying out the window. And then this one is adding a new my panel. And down here, you can see I am defining a class called my panel and extending J panel with it. And normally this would be in a separate .java file, but for the purposes of this lecture, it was put into the same uh, file as the main, uh, main class. And you can see in this case that I'm adding it to the frame. Normally you would add it to the content pane, but Java gave a shortcut that allows you to add it directly to the window. And what that really does is add my panel to the content pane. Okay. So if you remember uh, a frame, frame has a content pane. Okay, that content pane is always defined as a J panel. And you can either replace the J panel, or in my case, what I'm doing is I'm creating an instance of my panel and I'm adding it to the content pane. And you're saying, wait a minute, where did you do that? It's when I said f.add new my panel. And as I told you, this add statement, while it looks like it's adding directly to the frame, what it's really doing is saying f.get content pane is having the same effect as this, you said, get content pane dot add new my panel. Okay, so we're adding my panel to content pane. If you remember, the uh, top level is a border layout by default, unless you change it. So by default, it is a border layout. And when you do the add without specifying which region, it goes by default into the center region. Okay, so that's what's happening here. So I set my panel and I do two things. I generally want to have a, instead of calling set preferred size, instead I define a get preferred size method. This is provide it with every J panel. And by default, it returns a dimension of zero comma zero, which is obviously undesirable. So you want to override that method, remembering to make it public, it returns a dimension object and you're returning a dimension object that makes it 250, 200. So this is replacing the frames set size method or call because we're going to use the layout manager now to ensure that the size of the window is what we want. When we're doing custom drawing, we typically do it on a J panel. Okay, we can also do it on a J component, but normally we do that when we're creating what is called a widget, which is kind of a pre-application independent piece of drawing. Here, um, we are drawing custom graphics for the application, application specific graphics. So we tend to use a J panel for that, but don't get, I'm not going to get hung up on that. It's okay if you extend a J component rather than a J panel. So when I created the J panel, I did put a border around it. I created a line border with a black uh, line. That was the only thing I did as I created my panel. So the second thing I need to do is declare a paint component method, which you did um, in homework uh, four or five, I think four, you declared a paint component method. So you have some familiarity with it. 
it takes a graphics object as a parameter. And that's the graphics context that I was talking about earlier that needs to be set up properly. This object is only set up properly once the swing thread starts running. So the first thing you should always do is a super dot paint component command. What that does is it draw it clears the background and redraws the panel in whatever its background color is. Um, so if you don't do that, you'll get ghosting, which I will show you in a little bit. So for the time being, just accept that every paint component method should pretty much start with this super dot paint component call to the super class, which is defined by JPanel. And then here is how I draw a string in the graphics context. The graphics context lets you do a whole bunch of things. It has a bunch of commands for drawing uh, different uh, um, objects like strings, rectangles, ovals. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying, draw this string. This is my custom panel at the coordinates 10, 20. Okay, and you'll notice that when I ran it, it appeared at the top of the window. And that's because the Y axis starts at the top of the window. Okay, so again, a reminder that the way axes work in graphical interfaces is that the Y axis goes from the top of the window down to infinity. The X axis is what you expect. Okay, and with the graphics context or the graphics object, it allows you to draw shapes. It allows you to set colors or fill colors. It allows you to um, set line styles. Um, so those are the important things that it allows you to do, to draw shapes, set the color, set line styles. So this is definitely one of those things that you are most likely going to want to have to be able to easily look at the API. So if we look at the graphics, it's often going to behoove you to look at the API because there's a whole lot of things you can do uh, with it. So you can see here's something for drawing a circle. You may wonder how um, you draw a circle or an oval, you actually do it with draw arc. The start angle should be zero and 360 in that case. Um, actually, it might be, let's just take a look if it's radians or degrees. Um, the arc angle, the beginning angle, looks like it is in degrees. It looks like you would specify zero and 360. Whoops. Okay, but um, there's a way to draw an image. So that's a bitmap. Way to draw a line, a way to draw an oval. So in fact, um, an easier way to draw a circle would just be to draw an oval with the same uh, width and height. You can draw closed polygons. You can draw a polyline. So a polygon is a closed, the difference between a polyline and a polygon Polygon is closed, so that's a polygon. This is a polyline because it's not closed. So polygons closed, polylines are not closed. Okay, you can draw a rectangle, a rounded rectangle, a string, which is what we just did. Then, so the draw commands draw an outline. They draw the border. Then there's a separate set that do fill that fill it with a color. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. There's actually the draw, sh the draw shape commands 
draw a border. Okay, the fill shape commands fill the shape with a color. So if you want to have a object with an outline, you must both draw it and fill it. You, you have to call both methods in order to get a uh, shape that has a, a filled color and a border on it. Okay, then there is a whole bunch of things. You can set the font. Uh, we're not going to worry about fonts in this class because they're kind of complicated, but there's ways to set the font. Um, we won't worry about clip regions. Uh, should be a set color. There it is, set color. Allows you to uh, set the color that it, so I said that you could set the fill color. In fact, set color also sets the line color. So if you're drawing, it determines the line color of the border that you're drawing. And if you're filling, it determines the fill color. So you don't say set line color or set fill color. You just say set color and that covers both cases. And I actually um, was a bit wrong about the fact that you can set a, I said here that you could set line styles. Turns out you can set the fill color, which is true for both fill and line. You only get, in the AWT, you only get solid lines. And that was, if you remember, version 1.0. Version 2.0 was swing for the GUIs. And in version 2.0, so version 2.0 introduced what was called a graphics 2D object, which was a subclass of a graphics object. And in the graphics 2D object, you could set the line style. So it could be, for example, dashed, dotted. Uh, you could set the width, which you can't do in the aught. Um, so at any rate, this is important because for the quiz today, you, uh, one of the questions is what you can draw with graphics. You can draw shapes, you can draw um, both their outline and fill them. You can set the color, you can set the font. Um, those are the basic things that you can do. Okay. So that gave us Our, whoops, gave us this little output. But what we'd like to do next is be able to actually do some interaction with the interface. So what we'd like to be able to do is select things and move them around. Okay, and you'll notice there's some ghosting here, that's okay. But we want to be able to select things and have uh, be able to interact with our application. So that's what we're doing here in step three. So first of all, the paint method, we are now also going to be drawing a square. So you'll notice we, to draw the square, we set the color to be red. We call fill rect with the squares X and Y coordinates and its width and height. Then we do it a second time to draw the border. We set the color of the border to be black. And now we call draw rect to draw the border. Okay, so that uh, will mean, so going back here, So when we draw it, notice it appears over the text. 
first thing I'm going to do is change the order of drawing to show you what happens. When I draw the rectangle first. It's hard to see, but note it. I know it's very hard to see, unfortunately. But the it looks like the rectangle is transparent. And that's not because the rectangle is transparent. It's because it was drawn first, and then the string was drawn second. So the string actually gets drawn over the top of the rectangle. And that's why, in this case, the string appears to be on top. So drawing order is important. OK, and you'll notice. I did say that there's a ghosting problem. So as I'm drawing, or as I'm moving the rectangle, you'll notice this, this is called ghosting, where you parts of the rectangle are not getting dis, um, erased. Okay. And you'll notice I commented out super dot paint component. So remember, I said that super dot paint component blanks out the entire uh, panel and repaints it in its background color. So if I uncomment this and recompile and run it, whoops, there's still ghosting. That should not be happening. Did I recompile that properly? Make sure that I saved it. Oh, I know what's going on. Okay. Um, let me, okay. We'll solve the ghosting problem in a moment. Uh, there's something else going on here. So for the time being, we drew the square. And what we want to be able to do next is to interact with the rectangle by moving it with the mouse. And in order to do that, we need to be able to handle events. And the way we do that in uh, Java is with what are called listener objects. So every, you have a series, you have a number of different types of events. So in Java, whoops. In Java, you have say mouse event, you have a key event, you have a mouse motion event, which caps. So mouse events capture clicking, pressing, and releasing. Mouse motion um, are generated when you start dragging the mouse, like I am right now. Uh, with the widgets, you saw things like action event and a change event. Uh, so these are often called semantic events because they're generated by the widgets. They're high level events that contain information. These are often called syntactic low level events. Normally with widgets, you do not handle these events. The widgets handle them. But when you write your custom graphics, you have to handle these events. So associated with every event, there is a listener. So there is a mouse listener, an action listener, a mouse motion listener. So for every XXX event, you have an XXX listener that defines a number of methods for handling that event. And you have something called an XXX adapter for most listeners. So 
Most listeners define multiple methods. And oftentimes you only want to declare a subset of those methods. So the listener is an interface and the adapter is a class that implements the interface. And the adapter provides null or empty methods, provides empty method bodies. for all methods in the listener. So that means you only have to override the methods that you care about. And so these are, what you're basically doing is in the listener, these are, these multiple methods are called callback procedures. So these are procedures that get called when an event occurs. So we also have something called event generators. Widgets are event generators. Okay, so widgets emit events like action events, change events, so on and so forth. J panels, the ones that you'll be dealing with, emit mouse and keyboard events. So in order to handle an event, what you need to do is add a listener object to the appropriate event generator. And then that agent that event generator will call the appropriate callback method whenever the event gets generated. So if we look at one of the events, let's look at a mouse event first. you'll see, actually not the mouse event, the mouse event, what I want is the listener. You'll see that it has a number of different methods. So one that can be called when a mouse is clicked, that means after the mouse has been quickly pressed down and released, there is one for when a mouse enters the event generator and when it um, exits the mouse generator, one for when the mouse button is pressed and one for when it's released. So if you have mouse released and mouse clicked, the mouse released would get called first, then the mouse clicked would get called because it's actually a combination of a press and a release. Then mouse events have certain things that you can look at. So you can figure out, for example, which button was clicked. Uh, here we go, method summary. So you can get the button that was clicked, the click count, for example, if something was double clicked. You can get the modifiers that may have been down like shift, control, alt. Um, you can get the point, the x, y coordinates of the mouse or you can get it with get X and get Y. So there's methods associated with each event that you're allowed to query to get information about the event. And then you override in the mouse adapter, you override whichever methods you actually care about. So in our little demo program, what we care about is the mouse pressed event for the mouse listener. So a J panel implement or has, doesn't implement, it has a, it's an event generator for mouse events. So we're adding a mouse listener to our J panel and see we're creating a new mouse adapter because we only want to override mouse pressed. 
it's public void and we call move square. And you can see that we're moving it to the X, Y coordinates of the event. Okay. And then we're also interested in the dragged event. So this is the press. When it's pressed, we want it to jump to that locations. Uh, let's see. So if we run Java class path dot dot painting dot swing paint demo three. Uh, we're on Hydra wrong. Now I'm in the uh, parent class. So if I click here, it jumped. So that's the press. Okay. And then when we drag, that's a different event generator. That's the mouse motion listener. So again, we add a mouse motion listener and it turns out that a mouse adapter has a mouse dragged event with it. So it's actually a mouse adapter also defines methods for the mouse motion listener. I could have actually had a mouse motion adapter, I think here, but the mouse adapter handles motion events. So I care about the mouse dragged event. And again, I just call move square. Okay, and if we look at move square, you'll see that we set the square X and the square Y to its new values. You'll also see that we do a little something else. So we check to make sure that the mouse actually moved. So that's what the if statement is saying. If either the X or Y coordinates changed, we'll update the X and Y. And then we're doing what are, you see here, two repaints. So what repaint does is it tells, tells Java to repaint the window or to call paint component. And optionally provides what's called a damaged region. So by default, if you don't provide a damaged region, it assumes that the entire window has to be redrawn. But for large windows with a lot of objects, you don't often want to redraw the entire window. You only want to redraw the portion of the window that changed. So for example, here's the window, here's the rectangle. Let's say it moves to here. The two damaged regions are only this portion and this portion. So those are technically the only parts of the window that you want to redraw. Now in practice, repaint, if you call it multiple times with multiple damaged areas, it merges the damaged areas with into the smallest possible bounding box. So the bounding box is the smallest uh, rectangle that completely encloses the damaged region. So you might think, well, that still, if the object jumps all over the place, I'm still redrawing most of the window. But in fact, mouse motion events get called basically for every pixel move. So the initial mouse press will in fact cause a big portion of the window to be redrawn. But after that, generally every mouse motion event, a 
occurs on a single pixel. So it would be when you merge the two, it's pretty efficient. Now, something that I cannot say strongly enough, never, ever call paint component directly. That is something done by Java. You call repaint. If you want a window repainted, you call repaint. And then it will ensure that paint component eventually gets called. But if you call paint component directly, the graphics context is not set up properly. And you can get drawing quirks. So you never call paint component directly, you call repaint instead. That cues a paint event and in proper time, the window gets repainted. So in this case, I am calling repaint with the old coordinates and with the new coordinates and it is somehow this offset is causing the ghosting. So I'm going to have to check this offline. But the simple thing, get rid of my ghosting problem is instead of trying to be so specific, I could just call repaint here. And now the entire window is going to get repainted. And in your um, homework, it's fine to just call repaint like this and have the entire screen repainted. We're not going to worry about only repainting a portion of the screen. So it should be the case now that if I start dragging that rectangle around, yep, I no longer have any ghosting associated with it. Okay, so. That is repaint. The last thing I wanted to show you was that when you draw, it's important that you draw the fill first and then you do the draw. And the reason is if the border is more than one pixel, let's say the border is um, 10 pixels, then when you draw an object, let's say it's 25 pixels wide. What actually happens is five pixels go inside and five pixels of the border go outside. Okay, and the same thing here, five pixels inside and five pixels outside. So you think the width of the rectangle is 25, but in fact, the width of the rectangle is 35 because it has five pixels slopping out on each side. So to show you that, what happens, we go to our last demo. Okay, so here is a rectangle with a big fat border. Okay. And now what I'm going to do, whoops, is go to my other window and I'm going to see if I can't edit that thing under the covers. So swing paint demo eight dot Java. And I'm going to change the drawing order. So now I am drawing before I'm filling. And I will draw it. Something went wrong. I'm drawing, I'm sorry, I am displaying, it should be eight. Okay, so let's look at these two windows. 
it should be, see the difference? So in one window, the border has been fully drawn. In the second one, when I drew the border first, part of the border has been wiped out. Now, if that's what you want it, that's fine. But I'm just warning you that in general, you want to fill an object first and draw the border, which is what happens here, rather than um, drawing the border first and then filling it, which obscures part of the border. And you'll notice that this rectangle is wider than this rectangle right here. See this rectangle, both cases, is wider than this one. But if we look at the code, you would see that in both cases, I drew it, whoops. Uh, yes. In both cases, I drew the rectangles with the same width and height right there, both filled with the same width and the same height. So the one with the border, just to be clear, when you specify the width of the rectangle, you might say its width is 25, but in fact, you have to add in two times half the border width. Okay, which is 25 plus the border width because the slop is equal on either side. So that's in the quiz for today. The, you have to add in the border width to the um, width of the rectangle to get the actual amount of screen real estate it occupies. Okay, so with that, you should be able to uh, do the, um, you should be able to draw each of the panels in the application. There's a gauge view that you have to be able to draw and you should be able to do that. I will also uh, post um, some code that will help you with finding the distance to a line because some of you I know will struggle with finding the distance to a line. So I will post the uh, demo code that I used today to be Yaza. I'll also post something about distance. I'll check if the homework assignment has it. It may already have it. And on Thursday, we'll cover the model view controller, which is the final kind of, uh, it's a software engineering technique for organizing the code uh, for a graphical user interface uh, to make it easier to maintain. Okay, I will see you all Thursday. Uh, you're free to go. If you have questions, feel free to stick around and ask them. Also, I have office hours.